All right, this is our new class on sin. We called it studying, uh, studying Sin Seriously. And I will tell you this morning, you already have plenty of notes to go over for next week. We're not going to jump in this morning and actually start like we don't have a sin that we say, okay, we're going to start defining it, and we're going to start looking at all the places that we can find it. No, this morning we have to discuss why have this class at all. So, have you ever been, like I know when we go to the Hillsville Flea Market, we see a lot of this, or you might be walking through the mall or someplace like that. So, have you ever seen a demonstration of something? They want you to buy the product, and they have this lengthy demonstration, and you actually would say, this is interesting. He's doing a good job selling it. But then you walk away and you don't buy it. Why is that? <laughs> okay. A lot of times I would sit and look at a, uh, a demonstration and say they're doing a good job. They're making it look good. But if I just can honestly say, I'm not going to use that, then I don't need it. And that is exactly how a lot of people, they, they find no use for this type of study. So why is it they don't have any use? For this type of study. Let's study sin seriously. Why do they not have any use? Okay. They're, they're coming with preconceived ideas. They're going to say, what difference does it make? You know? Okay. If you've been taught that you were born in sin and you just can't help it, then I don't really need to know what is sin because I'm going to do it anyway. And then Mark said, if you believe born, uh, once saved, always saved, then it doesn't matter studying sin. Ian. Okay. Don't necessarily have any, you know, intrinsic value for today. So they would think, you know, why do I need to know about these standards they had back in the day when we're living in a whole other time frame? Okay. Another preconceived idea, like if someone said, "Well, law, God's laws change with culture," they don't see how they need it. One reason I would say is Christians that don't intend to talk to lost people have no use for this study, and we're not trying to. That's a lot of people on Facebook that are not members of the church, that saw the advertisement, they already have the wrong idea of this class. They think that we're coming in here to like call people's names out, that we're trying to judge people, that we want to put people like we're going to have on the screen everybody going to hell. That's not what we're doing. We're trying to educate ourselves to protect ourselves and then also help other people. So let's look at it this way. I'm going to try to sell you a study of sin. Why do a serious study of sin? So what would you think... If you go into the hospital, you go to the doctor's office, and you basically get to have a conversation, and the person practicing their medicine on you says, you know, I went to medical, medical school where I studied treatments and medicine, but I never studied disease or proper diagnosis. Would you feel comfortable? Okay. Everybody says no, and I'm saying, we like, this is your health. And do you know that when John writes in his later New Testament epistles, he says, I hope, I think it's first, or first John, no, it would be Third John. He says, I hope you're doing well in your spirit as you are bodily. We care very much about our bodily health, so why don't we care about our spiritual health? And that's what we have to deal with as far as sin goes. Now, I'm going to make a quick illustration. If you've got something to tie into it, that's fine. You know... The stomach problem I have, you can either have Crohn's disease or you can have ulcerative colitis. And we would say, you know, well, we get this, Caleb, but I don't know if it's going to necessarily be that, be that uh, extreme, the analogy. There are three things to have ulcerative colitis that have to show up in the test. If those three things don't show up in the test, then they would have marked me as having Crohn's. And do you know why that's a problem? Well, you can't cure it, but not all Crohn's medicine works for ulcerative colitis medicine. So y'all could be giving me the wrong medicine. You want people, you want your doctor to know what you're talking about, but you don't care if Christians know what they're talking about, and that's the problem. You, and something to talk about this, does everybody know the difference, and I'm not saying you have to explain it right now, but is there a difference between fornication and adultery? Yeah. Do both involve sexual activity? Yeah. But are they different? Okay, and you got to know those, don't you? Because if you get them confused, what do you end up having happen? You don't know what treatment to administer. You have very heavy consequences if you don't know the difference. Okay, here's another one. Or why, let's continue this idea, law and medicine. You know, 
doing word studies, we're going to do word studies as we come in here, but do you know that in Romans 7, 12, where he says, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good, if you actually do, this is just surface study, but if you look at Strong's Concordance and Strong's Dictionary, that word commandment could very well easily be translated prescription. So let's think about this. Now, would people say that keeping some of the commands of God are difficult? Okay, when somebody gives you medicine, what, what could you possibly say about it? Okay, this, this does not taste good. This is a big pill to swallow. Side effects. So another thing, when I had low iron, and who knows what all you need more iron for, but when I, they gave me a pill, they said, okay, we need to bump up your iron. And then this is what they said. Now it's probably going to hurt your stomach. I don't want to take it then. That's how it's going to be. When individuals start making up their mind, you know, man, I do need to repent. I got this stuff going on. And then somebody on the outside says, well, you better get ready. It's going to be tough. It's taking medicine. It's designed to help you. It's good. It's holy. It's a prescription. Now, here's one more idea. Matthew 9, 12 through 13. People, why do people not think about, you know, I need Jesus? Right there. They don't recognize that they're sick. Can you be sick for quite a while and not know it? Okay. So what you have to start like saying, for me, I'm going to keep using it, man. Y'all, I'm sick. So I would always be tired, always be cold, but I didn't have like these notable symptoms and everybody's saying, well, why don't you go to the doctor? Well, I'm not going to be able to just figure out why I'm tired and why I'm cold. And then they find out you got low vitamin D levels. See, we've got to go through these things because if there's a problem, the Bible can fix it. But people don't see it that way. Here's one more illustration. Traffic school. Tanner just goes through traffic school. I don't know. And I'll ask you this. Do y'all remember anything you heard in traffic school? Okay. Mark, you do? I don't. How far behind a car should you follow? Okay. <laughs> so, and this is, this is a good illustration on this is how Bible study differs from these other type of things. So the way they taught us in driving school was three seconds behind, and I don't know what that translates to a car length. So the way that they told us was if you're following a car and they pass like a light pole, you should count how many seconds it takes for you to get to that light pole. Now, Today we're going to accept a car link, two car links, three car links. Now I do know that at a stoplight they told us to stop three car links behind a car. Reduce speed by how much when it's raining? What did you say? Okay. Boy, this is something. Five miles, ten miles, they told us 15 miles. You should slow down 15 miles an hour when it, when it starts raining. Where in Virginia is it legal to make a U-turn? Okay. Virginia law is you can only make a U-turn in an intersection. You're like in the middle of a road, you shouldn't be doing that. Some intersections, Terry said, when it's posted, some intersections are going to tell you not to do it. But here's our question now. Let's think about this. Will the police pull you over for going 56 and a 55? Probably not, unless you're in Boone's Mill, right? Okay. Why did they make these three rules? Why did they come up with those things? Okay, boundaries. Safety. Now let's look at this one. What if the state of Virginia told everybody, we want you to put a green sticker in the bottom right corner of your windshield? What would you say? Okay, what's the reason for it, Ian says. And then they say back to you, we just want you, we want to see who acknowledges our authority. What would you say? Nope. No. Is it a law? <laughs> okay. Let's think about this. Is that how people actually view God's laws? I would say yes. They think, they look at the Bible and they see these laws, they see these statements, and they just think about <coughs> all kinds of things about it. Just this traditional and discourages free thinking they think of like an old bearded white man sitting on a cloud saying don't do this because i said so now i said if they did the state of virginia said this 
Ian, the question then becomes, what would you do? Ian says, I would ask them why. And do you know what today? It's fine. It's okay to ask why the Bible says something is sinful. Do you think that God in heaven, who made us intellectual beings, expected us to not question? There are reasons behind why he says to do certain things and to avoid certain things, and it's the same reason that we have traffic laws. It's all about safety. Medicine, you got a problem, we can fix it. He wouldn't like to fix our problems. And then I put this final point, number four, in there. Will please pull you over for going 56 and a 55. Y'all, we are going to inadvertently break God's laws at times. That's not the same thing as open rebellion. And the Bible says that in Numbers 15. There's a law for ignorance. And then he says there's a law for those who sin presumptuously. What, and let's say, talk about this too. How is it the case when we would say we would inadvertently break some laws? Why is that? Okay. Now, I don't mean like the speed limit law. Okay, or, so are you actually saying like there are things in God's law? that in a case of emergency would be different? Well, I was, I was referring to the speed limit. Okay, well, I'm, okay, that's fine. We're headed to the emergency room, you're probably breaking the speed limit. Okay, and the government allows for that. Yeah. So, but as we're talking about God's law, and I'm saying we are going to inadvertently break it because you can't be perfect, and I think in instances of that nature, God can be gracious to us. So what are, what are some reasons why we're going to end up breaking God's law? And it's the idea we're saying 56 and a 55. What would it be? Okay, ignorance. Okay, now we said ignorance is not the same thing as a presumptuous sin. Uh, you may be angry and say I th or say okay. You now, that's something we got to work at. Yeah. But again, if that's what you're working with, that's what you're working with. If you're trying to fix it, you're trying to fix it. Okay, so that's a good. Ian says people rationalize God's law by, or rationalize breaking the law by saying, if I really start cleaning up my life the way the Bible would suggest, then all these negative things are going to happen. What's the problem with that way of thinking? If you're not cleaning up your life, something negative is already happening. Okay, if you're not cleaning up your life, something negative is already in process. Your soul is in danger. Your circumstances could get worse, number two. But then number three, we cannot tell the future. You could actually say, man, I'm going to really clean up. I'm going to start following God. And what could the people around you do? What could they say? Me too. Thank you for your example. It, we always make it negative. Now, another part of this is being misinformed is not the same thing as presumptuous sin either. But what's the problem with being misinformed? Staying misinformed. That's the problem. You can learn the truth. When you learn better, do you start doing better? Okay. Now, we've got all these points ahead of us, and let's look at one more thing. We said about people, we say, man, I don't get why more people don't feel concerned about I need Jesus in my life. And this is a reason why. For, uh, in John one twenty nine, John said, uh, sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. How do people, they're not a Christian, and they're just barely religious. How do they describe Jesus? A good That's it. Well, he's a good dude. Gave us some good principles. That is not it. Jesus' entire mission, his entire function as the Christ is to take away our sin. And if you don't have that idea of him, then somebody would say, well, this uh, study is pointless for me. I'm not worried about sin, therefore I'm not worried about following Jesus. But if we had a mind of sin, then Jesus becomes that much more important. Okay. Now these are our illustrations. If we recognize medicine can have side effects, medicine can taste bad, but at the end of the day it is good for you. And then the traffic laws. you got to know them for everybody's safety. There was one that we didn't have in there. What's the uh, speed limit in a school zone? 25, and what's the purpose of it? 
don't hit somebody's child. Now, we all recognize that, and for those of us who are always in a hurry and you're already a speed demon, dropping from 60 to 25, you start grumbling. It's there for a very important reason, and how quickly can your car get back up to 60 miles an hour? That's how people sell a car. It goes zero to 60 and blah, blah, blah. And we can't slow down for somebody's child. Okay, let's look at some more points. You have this in your text. In Galatians 3.24, now, you're gonna, if you read commentaries, you're going to have a lot of people, this is just an illustration for this morning, you're going to have a lot of people don't like the word schoolmaster. But did not the law inform a whole entirety of people that they were in need of something? They had all these laws, and they had a structure on how to have their sins forgiven, which involved animal sacrifices once in the morning, once in the evening. You do your own personal. You bring your lamb when you need to, Leviticus 5, and then Leviticus 16, we're going to have an annual sacrifice for everybody. That's a lot of sacrificing, so that implies what? That's a lot of sinning. But he, he made that system, the sacrifices, to take care of their sins. Then you get to Galatians 4 1. They're not going to like the idea of schoolmaster. Then you get to Galatians 4 1 and 2. You've got tutors and governors. People don't, they don't see the value in Christianity because they're not looking at it as an education system. That is exactly what we are. You're, you're not here to be entertained. You, you do come here to get fellowship, which is good in itself. But this is an education institute. We should be learning, we should be growing. It's the same idea. All these things, we're learning these for our safety now. Ian got a new job however many years ago. What was one of the first things you had to go through? Safety training, right? We're not going to get out here like messing with chemicals, messing with all this equipment. Safety training, and that's exactly how the law works. And who, who's going to have a problem with that? They're not arbitrary. We're saying you get to question why. And now let's look at this. If we were to really ask you, and I'm saying don't be like extravagant, you know, I want a million dollar yacht. What are a lot of people really looking for, whether they realize it or not, in life? Fulfillment. Okay, a sense of fulfillment. I would say you're going to get that through personal evangelism. Acceptance okay. You'd like to be accepted by others. Probably not as a Christian, though. <laughs> stability. stability. I'll take that one and say that's, I think, what we're looking for. Stability. Quietness peacefulness, if you would like to have that, you are going to have to cut sin out of your life. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 And that ye study to be quiet, do your own business, work with your own hands as we commanded you. And 1 Timothy 2.2 2 says that we ought to pray for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. It works all over the place. If you follow biblical pattern for raising your kids, you can have a peaceful home life. If you follow the biblical instruction for uh, marriage atmosphere, have a peaceful home life. You follow what the Bible says about being an employee. You don't have to get wrapped up in everybody's workplace drama. And that's annoying. You can do your job, do your job very well, and let other people waste the employer's time and money. And you know what's going to happen if you do your job well while everybody else is fooling around? They take note. That's exactly right. And somebody says, well, the Bible talking about working hard. And they overlooked me last month. Maybe you don't work that hard. Maybe you talk a lot of trash. So, all these points in there, they're for our education. They're to help us have a better life. God is not just trying to be burdensome on us. Now, this is one where... Getting close to finishing up, but what's a new studying sin? This is going to touch a lot of things. What's a New Testament command that the church has that oftentimes does not get carried out? That's it. Good job. When you look at Second Thessalonians three, six, fourteen, and fifteen, chapter three, verse six, verse fourteen, verse fifteen. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now, 
There are multiple reasons as to why this command does not get carried out. You can find this in other places too. 1 Corinthians 5, Romans 16, 1 Timothy 6. Why does church discipline not get carried out? It tastes bad. It tastes bad. What tastes worse? An unclean, church. An unclean church is worse. And how does that that manifest itself, y'all, in a lot of ways? If you've got open sin that's not being corrected, they are setting precedent for everybody else. We have now just allowed sin to have free reign in the congregation. We can't correct anything else because that's always going to come up. Well, y'all let this go on. So how you going to come down on me? If, when that starts happening, what are people going to want to do less? You're not going to want to study. Why? Why would we study? we got this going on. We're not doing anything with it. I think that one of the biggest reasons I figured somebody would say family, right? People don't get withdrawn from because it's somebody's family member. But that's not what we're talking about. I think that church discipline does not get carried out because more times than not, those who are in the leadership do not know how to adequately define sinful activity. How do things usually go about? What are the talking points? Something's, something needs correction. How do people usually do it? I just don't think that's the best way to do it. I don't like that. Very vague terms that mean nothing. What's the best way to address a problem in the congregation effectively? Put a scripture to it, put the term on them, and say we're fixing to practice church discipline. But let's look at just one example this morning. There, I have hardly ever heard anybody talk about this one. Now, let's say this. What are the sins that get a lot of attention in Bible study? Okay. Idolatry. What? Okay. Smoking. Idolatry. Drinking. Let's look at this one together. We have, in this congregation, we have withdrawn from a member over this particular sin. Ephesians 4.31. Clamor. Now, a lot of times, people, like, you would see something, and what was it? What was the problem that we said is clamor? It's one thing to disagree, and that's fine. We can talk about it. But when you blow up in the middle of everything, and you actually ruin Bible class for everybody else, that is what the Bible calls clamor. Just the loud, boisterous disruption. Now, a lot of people don't know that that's there to begin with, let alone using it in the Scripture. 3 John 8 and 9, what was one of the things that Diotrephes did? Okay. He wanted to have the preeminence, and what did he do against faithful brethren? Let's look at this. I'm looking for a particular word. Pratting against us with malicious words. Now, we talk a lot of times in the Bible, so people are going to talk about drinking, they're going to talk about smoking, they're going to talk about fornication. How often are y'all going to hear about this sinful activity? Pratting against faithful brethren with malicious words. We don't just get to be talking trash about people. And if there's a real problem, somebody calls up, somebody, one of y'all calls up Mark and they say, uh, uh, Mark, I'd like to talk to you about something I saw Ian doing. And I don't think it's very good. And I just, okay, what should Mark say? If it was something private, Matthew 18, Mark should say, well, you need to take that up with Ian. If it's something open, then he should say, well, how about we both go talk to Ian instead of just talking about Ian on the phone. Look, we've got all this coming up in the class. This is why church discipline does not happen. And when you do not do church discipline, people end up not wanting to come to Bible class because it's an uncomfortable setting. Now, nobody can define sin. You've got all these different ones, chapters that we went over this morning. Maliciousness, malignity, whispers, covenant breakers, lasciviousness. We're going to talk about all these things over the next upcoming weeks. As we, what's that? Backbreakers. Backbiters. Yeah. Romans 1.30, but that's in there. We're going to talk about that too. Okay. Somebody says, we're fixing to wrap up. We'll probably make real quick of this. An all-loving God would not allow such moral, moral atrocities to happen. Why is that a bad argument? 
what should the if we followed the law, what would not happen? So whose fault is it? It's humans. It's not on God. And then what would happen? Someone says, "Well, I don't know why God doesn't intervene when these moral atrocities happen." What would people complain about then? I don't like I don't like a God that infringes on my free will. There's no pleasing people, but God is trying to protect us. Now, what are people going to think we're doing in this class? <coughs> Binding heavy burdens, straining at a gnat to swallow a camel. That is not what this class is about. We are not, look, y'all, we didn't come up with this class because we said, well, there's some sin going on in the congregation and this is going to be our way to, like, go a roundabout way to covering it. That's not what we're doing. We're really trying to get down to the information so we can better ourselves, so that we can protect ourselves, and then help other people with it also. And we're going to be realistic, too. Does the Bible say that sinning is fun? The Bible says you can have a good time doing some sin. Hebrews 11, 24, and 25. Moses rejected or refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter, called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Somebody says Christians don't want you to have fun. I tell you, some of it's fun. And then it carries a lot of consequences. Proverbs 9, 17, stolen waters are sweet. What's better than a uh, watermelon? A stolen watermelon. That's what John Shannon would say. He would say, man, a watermelon tastes good. Stolen one's even better. Bible says it right there. Bread eaten in secret is pleasant. It's got consequences, and we're going to talk about it. Okay, last one. Somebody says, I like this part of the Bible. Love God, love your neighbor. That's so pleasant. I like that. Not so judgmental. Well, I want to look at this. Have you asked this question before? On, the, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. How is it the case that love God, love your neighbor, everything else, is tied into that. How is that? Okay, and who else? If I love God and I care about my neighbor, I'm not going to involve myself in activities that hurt my neighbor. Does everybody love their neighbor? Do you even know all of your neighbors? This is a big time mind change that we all have to start cultivating. Who do we look out for? Number one. I'm looking out for number one. I've got to get rid of that idea. This is how the Bible says we're supposed to act. Love God, love your neighbor, and everything else hangs in on that. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. This is our last one. People are not looking at it that way. They're not seeing the dangers of sin, the consequences of sin. And so what is actually happening and why it's so pertinent that we all talk about sin and, and adequately define sin What's happening to people while they continue in sin? Number one, like Ian said earlier, your circumstances are probably going to get worse. Number, I'm talking about the inside of them, their inner man. What's happening? They are becoming past feeling right there towards the bottom, this line. Who being past feeling, they're getting used to it. And what, when we come along and say, have you thought about changing this, this point in your life? What are they going to say? Man, I've been doing that for like 20 years. No, I'm not going to change that now. What is it? Callous. Callous. Your conscience is seared. So this morning, these are all reasons why everybody should be studying sin. It's not this idea of God just doesn't want things for you and God wants to keep you pressed down. None of these things are arbitrary. They all have very, very heavy meaning and significance. And this is what you and I are fixing to embark on. So this morning, like we said... We had to make this study make sense and say, yeah, I need this. This is something I'm going to get use out of so that we're all ready to do the study as we continue the next several weeks. I'll be presenting. Ian is going to be presenting. And like we said, next time we come back, we'll retake this pop quiz together and we'll have homework for you next week. Any questions or comments as we stop here? Okay. If nothing, we'll take our break and get everything ready to go and we'll come back in just a few moments. Okay, thank you.